here. Wow, that's flavorful. So, 
as you see. There's a whole lot of German on this label. There's a picture of the Abbey, I believe, right there, where this is brewed. Benedictine monks. Yeah. There is a, um, a variation of Chimay. Chimay is also brewed by Bavarian monks. And there are three main varieties of Chimay. There's the white label, the red label, and the blue label. The white label is their Trapel, and that's my personal favorite. This tastes... I haven't had the blue or the red in quite some time, but I want to say it tastes like the blue label Chimay. And also very much like Three Philosophers that I've mentioned on the channel before. That's actually brewed in the U.S. in Cooperstown, New York. I've mentioned it a couple times here on the channel. It's from the Omegang Brewery in Cooperstown, New York. One of my all-time favorite beers. This is reminiscent of Three Philosophers as well. Which means I really love it. It's beautiful. Just a tiny bit of cocoa, um, some red fruit, raisins, dates, plums, that kind of thing. Not like a sugary chocolate flavor, but a, a semi-sweet or a dark chocolate flavor with red fruit. Boy, it's good. Incredibly flavorful. You gotta know what you're getting into with those Belgians. Um, but boy, that's amazing. Enough babbling. Chapter 15 of Tuesdays with Mari. Here we go. Chapter 15 is entitled sixth Tuesday, we talk about emotions. I walked past the mountain laurels and the Japanese maple, up the blue stone steps of Mori's house. The white rain gutter hung like a lid over the doorway. I rang the bell and was greeted not by Connie, but by Mori's wife, Charlotte a beautiful gray-haired woman who spoke in a lilting voice. She was not often at home when I came by, but she continued working at MIT as Maury wished, and I was surprised this morning to see her. Maury's having a bit of a hard time today, she said. She stared over my shoulder for a moment, then moved toward the kitchen. No, no, he'll be happy to see you, she said quickly. I'm sure. She stopped in the middle of the sentence, turning her head slightly, listening for something. Then she continued. I'm sure he'll feel better when he knows you're here. I lifted up the bags from the market, my normal food supply, I said jokingly. And she seemed to smile and fret at the same time. There's already so much food. He hasn't eaten any from the last time. This took me by surprise. He hasn't eaten any, I asked. She opened the door. She opened the refrigerator. And I saw familiar containers of chicken salad, vermicelli, vegetables, stuffed squash, all the things I had brought for Mori. She opened the freezer, and there was even more. Mori can't eat most of this food. It's too hard for him to swallow. He has to eat soft things and liquid drinks now. But he never said anything, I said. Charlotte smiled. He doesn't want to hurt your feelings. It wouldn't have hurt my feelings. I just wanted to help in some way. I mean, I just wanted to bring him something. You are bringing him 
something. He looks forward to your visits. He talks about having to do this project with you. How he has to concentrate and put the time aside. I think it's giving him a good sense of purpose. Again, she gave that far away look. The tuning in something from somewhere else. I knew Maury's nights were becoming difficult, that he didn't sleep through them, and that meant Charlotte often did not sleep through them either. Sometimes Maury would lie awake, coughing for hours. It would take that long to get the phlegm from his throat. There were healthcare workers now staying through the night, and all those visitors during the day, former students, fellow professors, meditation teachers, tramping in and out of the house. On some days, Maury had half a dozen visitors, and they were often there when Charlotte returned from work. She handled it with patience, and even though all those outsiders were soaking up her precious minutes with Maury, a sense of purpose, she continued, yes, that's good, you know. I hope so, I said. I helped put the new food inside the refrigerator. The kitchen counter had all kinds of notes, messages, information, medical instructions. The table held more pill bottles than ever. Celestone for his asthma, Ativan to help him sleep, Naproxen for infections, along with a powdered milk and laxatives. From down the hall, we heard the sound of a door open. Maybe he's available now. Let me go check. Charlotte glanced again at my food, and I felt suddenly ashamed. All these reminders of things Maury would never enjoy. Boy, that's delicious. his illness were growing, and when I finally sat down with Maury, he was coughing more than usual. A dry, dusty cough that shook his chest and made his head jerk forward. After one violent surge, he stopped, closed his eyes, and took a breath. I sat quietly because I thought he was recovering from his exertion. Is the day born, he said suddenly, his eyes still closed. Yes, yes, I quickly said, pressing down the play and record buttons. What I'm doing now, he continued, his eyes still closed, is detaching myself from the experience. Detaching yourself, yes, detaching myself. And this is important, not just for someone like me who is dying, but for someone like you who is perfectly healthy. Learn to detach. He opened his eyes and exhaled. You know what the Buddhists say, don't cling to things because everything is impermanent. But wait, I said. Aren't you always talking about experiencing life? All the good emotions, all the bad ones? Yes. Well, how can you do that if you're detached? Ah, you're thinking, Mitch. But detachment doesn't mean you don't let the experience penetrate you. On the contrary, you let the experience penetrate you fully. That's how you are able to leave it. I'm lost. Take any emotion. Love for a woman, or grief for a loved one, or what I'm going through. Fear and pain from a deadly illness. If you hold back on the emotions, if you don't allow yourself to go all the way through them, you can never get to being detached. You're too busy.
is he being afraid? You're afraid of the pain. You're afraid of the grief. You're afraid of the vulnerability that loving entails. But by throwing yourself into these emotions, by allowing yourself to dive in all the way, over your head even, you experience them fully and completely. You know what pain is. You know what love is. You know what grief is. And the only way you can say, all right, I have experienced that emotion. I recognize that emotion. Now I need to detach from that emotion for a moment. Maury stopped and looked me over perhaps to make sure I was getting this right. I know you think this is just about dying, he said, but it's like I keep telling you, when you learn how to die, you learn how to live. Maury talked about his most fearful moments, when he felt his chest locked in heaving surges, or when he wasn't sure his next breath would come from. Those were horrifying times, he said, and his first emotions were horror, fear, anxiety. But once he recognized the feel of these emotions, their texture, their moisture, the shiver down the back, the quick flash of heat that crosses your brain, then he was able to say, Okay, this is fear. Step away from it. Step away. I thought about how often this was needed in everyday life. How we feel lonely, sometimes to the point of tears. But we don't let those tears come because we are not supposed to cry. Or how we feel a surge of love for a partner, but we don't say anything because we are frozen with the fear of what those words might do to the relationship. Maury's approach was exactly the opposite. Turn on the faucet. Wash yourself with the emotion. It won't hurt you. It will only help. If you let the fear inside, if you pull it on like a familiar shirt, then you can say to yourself, all right, it's just fear. I don't have to let it control me. I see it for what it is. Same for loneliness. When you let go, let the stars flow, feel it completely, but eventually be able to say, all right, that was my moment with loneliness. I'm not afraid of feeling lonely. But now I'm going to put that loneliness aside and know that there are other emotions in the world and I'm going to experience them as well. Detach, Maury said again. His closed eyes. He closed his eyes and then he coughed. Then he coughed again. Then he coughed again more loudly. Suddenly, he was half-choking. The congestion in his lungs, seemingly teasing him, jumping halfway up, then dropping back down, stealing his breath. He was gagging, then hacking violently. Then he shook his hands in front of him, with his eyes closed. Shaking his hands, he appeared almost possessed. And I felt my forehead break into a sweat. I instinctively pulled him forward and slapped the back of his shoulders, and he pushed a tissue to his mouth and spit out a wad of phlegm. The coughing stopped, and Maury dropped back into the foam pillows and sucked in air. You okay? You all right? I said, trying to hide my fear. I'm... okay, Maury whispered, raising a shaky finger. Just... wait a minute.
we sat there quietly until his breathing returned to normal. I felt the perspiration on my scalp. He asked me to close the window. The breeze was making him cold. I didn't mention that it was 80 degrees outside. Finally, in a whisper, he said, I know how I want to die. I waited in silence. I wanted to die serenely, peacefully, not like what just happened. And this is where detachment comes in. If I die in the middle of a coughing spell like I just had, I need to be able to detach from the horror. I need to say, this is my moment. I don't want to leave the world in a state of fright. I want to know what's happening. Accept it. Get to a peaceful place and let go. Do you understand? I nodded. Don't let go yet, I added quickly. Maury forced a smile. No, not yet. We still have work to do. <clears throat> A quick flashback. Do you believe in reincarnation, I ask? Perhaps. What would you come back as? If I had my choice, a gazelle. A gazelle, yes, so graceful, so fast. A gazelle. Maury smiles at me. You think that's strange? I study his shrunken frame, the loose clothes, the socks. <clears throat> the socks, wrapped feet that rest stiffly on foam rubber cushions, unable to move like a prisoner in leg irons. I pictured a gazelle racing across the desert. No, I say. I don't think that's strange at all. And that's how we end chapter 15 of Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album. Chapter 15 of Tuesdays with Mari, and I hope you jo you'll join me for Chapter 16 in the next video. We're getting to the part of the book where Mari is in his final days, and it's going to turn quite sad very fast. But that's okay. We all know it's coming. Just as the author Mitch Album expresses in the book, we all need to be grateful for the time we are getting to spend with Maury and for the wisdom that he is imparting upon the world in his final days. Here's to you for joining me tonight. Boy, that's good.
assume is that abbey right there. It's very good. It's very complex, very flavorful. <clears throat> and really not what I expected from the look of the bottle. So, a pleasant surprise, reminiscent of other outstanding beers that I've enjoyed over the years. And I gotta recommend it to you. If you can find it, check it out. Look at that color. That's gorgeous. Deep red. I'll see you back here again next time. Good night.